Hello everyone, this is Philosophy of the People with Ben Burgess and Stephen Bertram. And I was maybe responsible, and I, I read the essay instead of like immediately before, and I read it last night. But that just led to me forgetting what my stupid anecdotes were meant to be. <laughs> I was going to complain good. that whenever I, I try and make the stream go live, it's like, actually, do you want to do this in portrait mode? And I'm like, no. <laughs> like. But every time it's like, this would be better in portrait mode. It's like, why? It's like, no, it'd just be better, mate. Fair enough. Um, but one thing I was going to say was, I didn't really, well, I, I only kind of realized it last night, even though we talked about kind of Marxist and logic before, and you, you kind of say in the essay that yeah. for, a while, for a while you didn't really connect them. But yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, wait, Ben's kind of stuff about the liar paradox, which goes into non-contradiction or whatever. It's actually kind of perfect for kind of the, the even though you didn't intend it that way, it's perfect for kind of the ways that Marxists engage with with logic. Uh, yeah, certainly it connects to some things that some Marxists say about logic. So, um, so yeah, I the um, so there are two things going on here. One is that. Uh, there, you know, is that uh, there's something called dialectics, the dialectical method, um, dialectical analysis, or some people will tell you dialectical logic uh, that some Marxists have taken to be in. Um, in conflict with classical logic, or at least in conflict uh, <laughs> with it, to um, you know, to the extent that like um, you know, Einsteinian physics is in conflict with Newtonian physics, which is to say that you could still um, you know, on this view, this is like what Leon Trotsky, for example, says in his essay, "The ABCs of Materialist Dialectics." Um, you know, that you can still think that one is a sort of good enough approximation for many practical purposes, but that the other is, you know, the real thing. Um, so, so that's one issue, but then, yeah, there's, is, uh, uh, sorry, just being amused by the chat, but, uh, then, classical. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, so yeah, then, but then, um, then there's questions about how, you know, there's like a different sort of set of problems you could have with classical logic, which uh, just have to do with sort of uh, paradoxes. Um, so if I say this sentence that I'm saying right now is not true, uh, then, you know, according to the law of excluded middle, it either is or isn't. But uh, that would be a problem because if it is, it isn't. If it isn't, it is. And either way, that looks like it violates the law of non-contradiction, right? It says that nothing is both. And and yeah, this is the stuff that when I was a you know when I was a graduate student, uh, I was doing my you know academic research on. It's what my dissertation uh, was uh, was on, and I. Yeah, I have a, a book, which is not conveniently behind me, but... Uh, Purchasable on Amazon.com. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, whatever. It's not behind me. And uh, it's uh, called Logic Without Gaps or Gluts. That's, uh, that's an adaptation, basically, of the core argument from the dissertation. Um, yeah, which, you know, I, I make a comment in the essay like the timing of which will never not be funny to me because it, uh, it, it came out the same week that I went on Joe Rogan. So that's the, the three most watched hours of my life and the book that I wrote that the fewest people are ever going to read, uh, at the, uh, at the same time, uh, cause it's, you know, from an academic press. So it's very expensive and it's about a, you know, obscure esoteric uh, topic. And I presume even in your case, like for yourself, if, if someone asked you to recommend one of your books to read, the group that you'd recommend that one would be a very small share of them. Yes, correct. Yes. 
yeah. Now you might, might recommend it to me, but yeah, yeah, I might recommend it to you. Uh, but yeah, there's there be most people if they're just like, oh, I want to pick up one of your books, and like I have uh, no particular information about them to, to make them me think they're in that group. That wouldn't be the one I would say. Um, I mean, Someone asked me on Reddit, "Ask Philosophy, can I recommend them a philosophy paper published in the past fifty years?" And I was like, only in the sense that I could like recommend you a book out of the National Library. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, could they narrow it down a little bit more? There's the philosophy paper in the last fifty years. Like, is it a topic? Yeah, yeah. Or any kind of yeah, thing. that would help. Uh, you know, I. Uh, I've gotten much better, but you know, I used to, uh, I used to joke that, you know, I was, uh, I didn't, uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, that I didn't have, you know, so yeah, don't ask me about anything before about 1969, you know, that's, that's where I, that's where I come in. Uh, but, um, but yeah, no, this is, uh, so, so yeah, they, in that book, right. I'm talking about the, the second uh, the second set of issues uh, that, you know, the issues about classical logic uh, from the perspective of thinking about uh, paradoxes, you know, semantic paradoxes like the liar, which is the one that is mentioned or uh, set theoretic paradoxes is the set, you know, of all sets that are not members themselves, a member of itself, all that stuff. Um, and, and in the, in so doing, right, the, you know, like, like my project in that, you know, the dissertation and the book very explicitly is to defend classical logic, to show that you can make sense of all of these things, you know, without, uh, without having to, um, to, to give up uh, either of those two principles that I mentioned, excluded middle or non-contradiction. Uh, but then you know, depending on like which kind of sub tradition you were reared in of, of how to think about, you know, dialectics, the dialectic, you know, whatever, uh, you, you might think, well, hold up. Um, this is silly. You're, you're supposed to be a Marxist and is, uh, you know, why, why would you want to defend classical logic? Right. You know, why do you want to hold on to this, this kind of, um, yeah, but then you're not, you're a communist. Why do you want to defend like arithmetic? You yeah, fascist. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the clearly, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, because uh, because again, there, there is this, there is at least some tradition of you know seeing some sort of conflict there, um, and then you know, so this is kind of um, this is kind of where the you know, the essay came out of, I mean, it's basically the transcript of a presentation I gave a couple weeks ago in Ann Arbor. I was, um, I was there to do like a, a guest lecture for Matt McManus's, uh, citizenship and democracy class. And I did a, like a Palestine talk for Detroit DSA and Wayne state YDSA. But while I was there, I went to, you know, I, you know, Matt's, is in a Hegel reading group at U of M, which invited me to, to come talk to them about, uh, they wanted me to talk about formal and dialectical logic. And um, I suspect because of, you know, widespread suspicions that uh, I, I'm a, a, a deviationist who, uh, who's uh, you're, you're trapped. Some kind of, you're kind of surface level socialist. who doesn't really get it. Yeah. Never, you know, trapped in this, this kind of, uh, you know, narrow-minded analytic philosophy kind of way of doing things and, you know, can't appreciate the the depths and subtlety of uh, Hegelian dialectical logic. Um, <laughs> I can put well, it yeah. close to the camera. There you go. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so essentially, like, what I'm not doing in here, which would be interesting to do, and I've kind of tried to do just a teensy little bit in the two essays I wrote about this last year, is to sort of say, okay, like what it like, what is like the correct way to to think about dialectics or dialectical methodology or whatever we think that is? Um, should you, you know, should you just kind of be, um, should you just kind of say, eh, 
there's uh, there's this there's nothing here that's really worth holding on to, uh, or um, or you know, is it the you know on the other end of the spectrum? Do you actually think that there is this like unique methodology that you're just not going to get you know if you don't uh, express it in this kind of Hegelian language, uh, or you know somewhere in between the two? You know, is it could it be that this is a sort of um, you know, for historically specific reasons, this is a kind of idiom that people use to, um, you know, kind of suggestive language that, you know, comes with, um, you know, that like is often used to suggest a certain set of ins insights that can ultimately be paraphrased, um, you know, outside of that language, right? Uh, which, which would, you know, obviously I've kind of given it away in that, tendentious way of setting it up that, you know, that, that, that my, my sympathies lie right around number three, right. In that, uh, in that series, but I'm not trying to, uh, you know, that, you know, again, I, I, I sort of gesture at that a little bit of the stuff I wrote about this last year. I should write something more in depth about that, but all I'm trying to do here is something much narrower, which is just to say, okay, look, if you think there's some sort of conflict between these two things, what is it? What could it be? Right. Given, um, you know, I understand, you know, if it's Hegel, you know, I hesitate to make uh, confident pronouncements about, you know, anything that Hegel said, because people, uh, you know, because there's there's always like 20 extant interpretations of every sentence that ever came out of that guy's mouth. But um, but certainly when you get to like Ingalls. Right, Ingalls, I very confident that I understand what he's saying. Right, so if you, so if you read uh, the uh, the anti during, which is, um, you know, got to pause every time you mention this book to feel sorry for Herr During that the uh, that it's been like a hundred, you know, it's been like a century and a half since anybody has thought about his name in any context other than the fact that there's a book called the anti during. But uh, that's uh, but in that book, right? There's this uh, you know, there's this chapter where um, where Ingalls sort of lays out these principles of dialectical analysis, uh, and in you know, and those we can actually look at and sort of say, okay, well, what is he saying, and is there anything here? that um, that would be in some sort of conflict with the principles of classical logic such that we'd have to choose even in the sense that like somebody like Trotsky thinks that we that we have to choose. Um, and you know, I mean just to just to go ahead and spoil the ending, I I think no, I, I, I don't see how. I mean like I, I ultimately do think this is like this is a little bit like saying like you know communists aren't allowed to believe in arithmetic. Yeah, I mean, I, I did like this essay more than kind of the Trotsky one because with the Trotsky one, I was like, well, you're just kind of being cranky and annoying and like none of this makes sure. sense. But sure. it, was, it was nice to go back and, you know, talk about what Marx said and what Michael said to kind of see what the basis was and see if there was any basis. Because uh, obviously, you know, as you say, like stuff like the negation, negation, if you take it and just kind of insert it formally right as that into logic, then, yeah, that's a violation of some pretty important stuff. But if you take it in the context where it meant, and I think this is the most, not to skip ahead, uh, as I always do. <laughs> but I think the most important bit of your essay is where you point out on, in, in situations like negation and negation, what is happening there is specifically and exactly qualitatively different things. Like the negation of the negation in Marx, very importantly that this second negation is qualitatively different from the first one. And that's kind of very important that the, the boot the bourgeois expropriation and the proletarian, the oncoming future proletarian expropriation are qualitatively different things and specifically non-identical. Yeah, exactly. So uh, when you think, you know, like, like out of the three principles that are, I don't know if principles is even the right word exactly, but whatever, out of the three things that, uh, that Engels mentions. The good, the good useful rules. Yes. Out of the three good useful rules Engels mentions, 
Uh, the one that sounds most like logic -y and hence like, okay, maybe there is some sort of interest in, you know, clash here uh, is, uh, is the negation of the negation, right? Cause, cause he used the word negation, you know, which, uh, which is a word that comes up a lot in, you know, actual, you know, logic, logic. Uh, but, it seems to be being used to mean very different things, right? So uh, when you, like the negation of a proposition is just, you know, not whatever the proposition is, right? So, um, and, and of course, anybody who knows, um, you know, a little bit of logic or even just kind of ordinary language, right, knows that... Uh, in that sense, right, the propositional sense of negation, uh, the negation of the negation just works out to the original thing, right? That the uh, that um, you know, if I if I say, you know, if I put, you know, I mean, informal logic, if you have like a little Greek letter or something to represent a proposition, you put a neg two negation signs before it, right? then those just cancel each other out, right? You could, you just, you know, you could just derive the original Greek letter from it. Or again, I think we have a, we all kind of understand how that works on the, the level of ordinary language that if, you know, you say something is not, not true, right? Then, then it's, it's true. Um, and whereas, uh, you know, if you think, if you start thinking, okay, well, what does Ingalls actually mean when he talks about the negation of the negation? One, it's not talking about propositions at all, right? And, um, you know, this is, in fact, supposed to be, you know, a method of analysis that applies to, you know, historical events, right? If it applies to anything, right? The uh, From a, a Marxist point of view, certainly. Uh, and, and second, uh, the negation of the negation, as you say, does not take us back to the uh the original thing right that, that like very crucially it doesn't take us back to to the original thing right because this is any sort of um you know if you want to sort of t if you want to talk about you know dialectical materialism well what is that um you know or for that matter like hegelian you know dialectical idealism right like you know what, what what are these things theories of right these, these are these are theories of you know his of historical progress um and you know the and both of these are you know theories that postulate that you know progress is a thing that happens right you know that it's that the that things continue going forward, right? I mean, this is the sort of thing that, like, there are many types of, um, you know, academic distaste for for Marxism that that like uh, focus on precisely this fact about right. it. Historicist or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That it's you know, it's like what what do you? I mean, this is something I've had. Um, you know, I've, I've even seen like. I don't know. I've, I've even seen people who I basically like politically who are trained in certain kinds of academic disciplines who, um, who will, who will sort of make a big deal of saying, you know, to be clear, I don't think there are laws of history. I was like, well, why not? Right. <laughs> but you know, what if there were? And it's lots of physics, lots of biology. Yeah. All this, the mystery is biological or physical as in, a non-organic physical thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like you could, you, you know. Yeah, why not? Right, come on. Like you know, they're probably just uh, going to be impossibly vague. <laughs> you know, it's so like the laws of history, shit happens. <laughs> Things change. Uh, yeah. Um. You know what, Silver? I think I did forget to post it there. My apologies. Um. But uh. But in any case, um. Yeah, and I do want to get to Kushluk's question because, uh, yeah, I, I think that's more than a sentence. But uh, but just to just to get to the through the basic point about the negation of the negation, uh, in both the Hegelian and Marxist versions, right? I mean, those are this is you know you're talking about theories of historical progress. Um, 
that um, this is, um, yeah, that they have a, so given that, uh, crucially, right, the negation of the negation doesn't take you back to the the original thing. And so, you know, since I had, um, you know, as I was writing this, uh, I, I think I'd just written the essay or maybe I was still in the process of writing the, writing the essay about um, the, uh, the, you know, land, you know, Marx and Rawls versus Nozick and the land back left. So I was thinking about capital and this seems like, uh, it's like, look, you want to know what Ingalls means by the negation of the negation. It seems like the, the sort of revolutionary conclusion of the primitive accumulation section of capital uh, shows you a really obvious example, maybe the most important example from Marx and Ingalls' perspective, which is uh, that you have um, that, um, you know, the... Marx talks about, you know, the negation of the property rights of peasants uh, at the birth of uh, birth of capitalism. And um, then in turn, you know, says, look, this can't be, you know, this it's it's impossible and undesirable. Right. Is this can't be turned back. But what we can do is go forward, you know, by expropriating uh, the expropriators uh, that, you know, you can, you know, negate the negation of, uh, of the, the, you know, those original peasant uh, property rights, not in the sense that we're going to, you know, figure out uh, exactly where, you know, Stefan's uh, ancestors, you know, had their hereditary rights to, uh, to a little plot of land so they can, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you can, uh, you could fulfill your lifelong dream of, you know, being a petty dirt farmer. Uh, but, uh, but in the, you know, but we can, you know, we can take right. The, the class of expropriators and we could expropriate them and we can, um, we can create something better, right. Which is, which seems like a really good indication that, you know, that what we're talking about here again, is works in a just a fundamental you know we're talking about a fundamentally different kind of thing right like not you know i mean both in the sort of obvious sense that you know we're not um you know we're not talking about propositions we're talking about you know events historical processes but also that um you know that it's that negation in this sense doesn't seem to to work at all in the same way Right as as propositional negation, this is just a different thing that, uh, and you know, and, and this is, you know, and this is like a different version of the same point that I was making way back in um, the the very first book. Uh, the one you know, want to be much more likely to recommend to people, give them an argument uh, <laughs> that because uh, I, I I do have a little chapter on this there, which is you know kind of funny actually. It's like anybody who is like. Anybody who overall liked the book, but uh, this was the this was the chapter that was the but because this was like uh, everybody, you know, because like the the first few chapters are much more light and fun, and you know, and, and this one, you know, it has truth tables in it. There's you know, mm -hmm. there's this stuff about um, you know, it's uh, there, there's stuff about logic and dialectical logic, and you know, and and how they might relate to each other. And so the version of the point that I made way back there is like, look, if you, you know, if you're talking about, you know, if you just think about typical Marxist sentences that involve the word contradiction, um, pretty clearly we're talking about something very different from propositional contradictions that, um, you know, if you're talking about a, like a contradiction between class interests or, you know, you're talking about like, I don't know, capitalism being brought down by its internal contradictions or something like that, right? Like this is, these are clearly ways of using the word contradiction that, you know, there's like maybe the most distant possible analogy, but other, but like, you're just, you're, you're just using the word in a fundamentally different way. You know, this isn't a competing theory of the same subject matter, right? You know, this is, this is just a, you know, this is just a, a different thing. Yeah. I mean, I think, in common language, I think we would say, like, you know, something contradicts itself 
for something where like it has a self-facing floor or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. Like, I think we do say uh, that things are, um, or like we, yeah, I think we'll sort of use words about contradicting or inconsistency or things like that, where we're not actually talking about logical inconsistency. We're talking about like aspects of a thing that, in some sense, seem to point in, you know in different directions, right? You know, that like, like where we're talking about people's personalities, you know, having surprising layers or whatever, right? right? You know, we might even use the word contradiction to, uh, to, to apply to that. And I, th I think that's probably closer to the mark of, of what's actually, you know, meant by, by somebody like Ingalls, you know, when he, uh, he uses, uh, he uses terms like this, right? Like, I think that uh, oftentimes, you know, oftentimes I think uses of contradiction uh, in, you know, Hegelian and Marxist traditions um, probably refer to things like they're um, just, there being like an internal tension within a, within a system or a setup or uh, something having different conditions for realization that can't actually all be realized at the same time. Um, or, you know, there, there being, yeah, there being elements of a system that, uh, that, you know, over time tend to undermine each other, or, you know, or, or something like that. Right. Like, and, and I think that in any, you know, so this is the thing that I don't really spell out in the essay itself. Um, but, you know, in any of these cases, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, like the, the thing, you know, ultimately the work that needs to be done is just to say, okay, can we spell out in other language, uh, you know, exactly what's, what's being said, you know, when, when somebody, you know, when somebody says one of these things, right? Because there is, like, I, I do think the downside of, not so much like Ingalls, but like, you know, I think like more contemporary Marxists sometimes uh, the downside of the use of this language is that um, sometimes it does end up being a bit of a cheat code, right? Like I think that uh, I think, you know, I mean, surely you've met people who use the word dialectical in ways that make you suspect that at best it's just sort of a way of saying, I, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated, man. You know, like it's a form of prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. At worst, it's like a form of prayer, you know. But like, at best, it's just a, a a sort of philosophically fancy way of saying that things are really complicated and hard to understand. You need to remind me by naming your first book. You know, if you type in GTA A on YouTube, at least for someone who isn't like an owner of the GTA A YouTube, <laughs> it comes up with like Grand Theft Auto Five multiplayer games. I, I'm not the least little bit surprised. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, um, but yeah, the first book, uh, was, uh, was called, uh, give them an argument logic for the left. Yeah. I had something to say on the, the dialectics, but I forgot about it. Does it break your brain? Yeah. My brain is being, being hacked. Uh, I was just thinking about Heraclitus. Okay. Well, you, you were mentioning about kind of the laws of history. And I'm very much a, you know, I think he is actually true that we never step in the same river twice. Uh. Like, even if you don't, yeah, even if we are suspicious of the kind of Marxist idea of kind of eternal progress or whatever, and if that's even a Marxist idea, um, uh. I mean, well, Marxism is meant to end at some point. Um, you know, even if we had cycles of capitalism and feudalism, they would all be different and unique, right? Yeah, I, I mean the um, right. I mean, presumably you don't have eternal progress if only because you know there's the heat death of the universe, right? That's uh, oh right. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> like... I do. I do. Have a, I do have a Marxist friend who does get annoyed about the, the heat death of the universe. So, <laughs> can we not yeah. get past that? Like. Yeah. Now, come on. Surely, surely we'll come up with a technical fix sooner or later. Um, yeah, I, I do know. I, I haven't actually read any of this, um, 
maybe someday I'll, I'll I will, but I, you know, uh, you know who Ted Grant is? Not sure. Okay, Ted Grant is. Uh, I don't even know if he's still alive or not, uh, but he is or was a uh, a Marxist theoretician in the you know people, you know the the militant tendency of those people way back when. Right. Um, and I think he like, I think he had some sort of factional falling out with, with his former comrades and that tendency. Cause that happens, you know, but, um, that's, uh, but in any case, I, I might be slandering the man here, right? Like this is something I feel like I remember. So it's probably irresponsible to repeat it on YouTube, but, um, uh, I'll do it anyway. I, um, I believe that he he wrote something that's like rejecting Big Bang cosmology <laughs> for some sort of Marxist reasons that I don't, <laughs> I don't I don't know or understand. But uh, this is so you know maybe you know maybe this is the uh, you know maybe that's the uh, oh that's what I was going to say yeah I was I mean, thinking right throughout that. The, I think it's the kind of the movement to being like, oh no, actually logic isn't real or whatever, is the same kind of move where just it, there's this massive concept creep going on with Marx's concepts, where kind of like Marx is saying, you know, I've got this theory which kind of shows the contradictions in bourgeois economics, which kind of undermines bourgeois economics. And then Marxists subsequently take this thing and massively con concept creep it to say like it undermines bourgeois or just generally everything yeah or I mean, that, you know some new theory comes along and they're like actually quantum physics proves that dialectical materialism is true about everything yeah um yeah i'm uh there are very few cases i think of philosophers who make comments about quantum physics that don't make me feel vaguely embarrassed because you know I don't know enough to be sure that they're getting it wrong, but I have a I, I think that just goes for every, everyone, right? That isn't a quantum physicist. Extremely strong feeling that they're getting it wrong. Yeah. Um yeah, okay. Somebody in the chat says, uh oh, uh Kilgore Kraut says Grant died in 2004. Okay, 20 years ago. All right. Uh wow. Uh did you what have you watched the uh, three body problem at all? No, I haven't actually. Uh, I just okay. saw it because it started a drama in Turkey because they made one of the hero generals a woman from Yepage. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I've, I've only watched the first couple episodes, but the first one, the, the first scene of the first episode is set in China during the Cultural Revolution, and there's like a, there's like a denunciation session of yeah, a physicist, yeah. uh, you know, that's, that, that has to do with the various ideological deviations from the, the like theories about physics that he holds, um, which, uh, which the grant thing, uh, you know, really strongly reminds me of, uh, but yeah, I, I guess I did see, okay. So a while ago in the chat, I believe Kush look, I saved at, it. Oh, you saved it. Okay. Very good. This one, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Which the Marxist laws of history are correct. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I think it depends on how you're you're interpreting the claims, right? So so in other words, um, you know, there there are just to be like tediously pedantic about this, right? You know, you you have uh, two questions, which are one, what is historical materialism claim, and two, you know, is it true? And um, you know, I, I think just focusing for a second on the first one, um, whatever else it's supposed to be a theory of, it's certainly supposed to be a theory of how it is that modes of production rise and fall over time. That why it is that, you know, we used to have feudalism and now we don't, and we have capitalism instead. And, you know, inshallah, one day socialism, etc. Right. So, um, and, you know, there is an interesting interpretive question about, okay, is this the sort of thing that historical materialism is supposed to be a theory of, or is it also supposed to be a theory of like a bunch of other stuff too, right? Like a bunch of finer grained things uh, about, about history. 
Um, and I think the evidence is a little bit mixed. Um, and, and it also depends. I think oftentimes people who want to take it as a theory of something finer grained are maybe mixing up a little bit like historical materialism per se with, um, with some sort of broader concept of like class analysis. So what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you take this sort of canonical statement of historical materialism as uh, what Marx says in the 1859 preface, um, which, you know, I, I would point out, you know, like there are a bunch of other things that he says earlier and later that make it seem like this is like a pretty consistently held uh, view of his. I know that the, uh, I know that like there are some people, some like degrowth communist kind of people who have convinced themselves that later in life he gives up on it. But uh, I'll just say I'm unswayed by the textual evidence for that. I um, love to invent deathbed conversions. Yeah, yeah, or like useful uh, truthers. <laughs> Marx was based yeah. all the times he wasn't doing serious like uh, written work. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, it's the what you got to do is like, uh, you know, if he like jotted down a ses sentence on the back of a napkin once, uh, then you know, then that's that's definitely evidence that the thing that he spent like twenty years working out carefully, right? You know, it's like no longer what he it thought. Is uh, young Marx destroys Stalinism when like all the stuff <laughs> was published by the Soviets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. That's, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I think like the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844 are interesting. I think there's a lot of good stuff in it, but I think that the idea that, um, that there's like this thing in there that sort of fundamentally contradicts the, like the, you know, economic determinism or whatever of the, the later stuff. Uh, again, I'm very unswayed by the textual evidence for, but in any case, you know, I, I think that if you take that kind of 1859 stuff as the core of what historical materialism is supposed to be, uh, then what, you know, what Marx basically says there are, are a couple things, right? So that um, there's that the um, the uh, legal and political superstructure of a society is uh, is a, is an effect of, uh, of of its economic base. You know what the class relations are, uh, and that the base in that sense, right? The class relations are an effect of uh, the development of the forces of production. Um, at least that's the part that's clearest. There's also some stuff about social being and social consciousness, which is very, um, you know, which is very suggestive, but it's also like a little bit less clear what that means. Right. And, and, you know, and if, if you really want to sort of, um, if you really want to go nuts with the implications here, I guess that would be the part that you'd want to seize, you know, seize hold of because it's like okay what, is, what does it mean you know social being determined social consciousness does that mean like everything right that uh so you know class analysis is going to tell you why the last marvel movie had the plot that it did and you know and 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 why uh you know who's going to win eurovision and like uh or you know or some sort of interesting and significant subset of of everything but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the core claims about uh, forces of production, relations of production, and legal and political superstructure, yeah, I, I think that that stuff is mostly true, right? Like, I think that that's, I think that that's um, you know, you can sort of allow a reasonable amount of room for historical contingency and still say, yeah, this does actually seem like a very good explanation of why it is that we have the kinds of institutions that we have in the world today and why we used to have different ones, and, you know, why one day we might have still other ones and so on. Right. You know, that, um, that, you know, saying, you know, there does seem to be a, you know, 
I mean, on the face of it, there sure seems to be a connection between the transition from primitive communism to sort of directly extractive early class societies and the agricultural revolution. Uh, and there similarly seems to be a connection between the, you know, between the transition between feudalism and capitalism and the industrial revolution that, uh, that those, those things seem to be very intimately related to each other. I think that there's some a priori reason to suspect that if one system does a better job of, uh, facilitating the development of the forces of production than another system, that it's, it's, it's good that the system that does a better job is going to expand. It's, it's going to, um, you know, it's on, on the there, free marketplace of modes of production. Yes, exactly. It'll win out in the free market of modes of production. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, if nothing else, you'll have, um, you know, better, you know, if, if you, if you're better at further developing the forces of production, if nothing else, you'll probably have better military technology and you'll be better able to win wars. Right. So that alone is going to give you some kind of edge. Uh, there's, you know, surely, you know, a large part of the transition from primitive communism to, to early class societies takes place through like conquest and enslavement, you know, of, of, uh, of, of primitive communist tribes. Uh, there's, so that's certainly, that's certainly a big one. And, you know, and, and obviously that also plays a big role in transition to capitalism. I think that the, um, I think just just sort of power of example causes a lot of emulation, right? You know that um, you have, you know, if you're the, um, you know, if if you're like a, a Scottish uh, lord, you know, who sees all of these people who are making all this money by becoming, you know, by by. Uh, basically, turn, you know, turning themselves into modern capitalists, uh, that'll give you ideas and say, oh, if we could just get rid of all these fucking peasants, we could, you know, uh, we have, have all this land here that I'll bet I could actually make a lot of money off of as a sheep pasture. I thought you were about to uh, you when you mentioned the Scottish Lord. <laughs> uh, you know, that's... Uh, uh, so, like, that kind of that kind of power of emulation, right? Yeah. Um, you know, does it. So I, I, I think there are like a bunch of plausible mechanisms that mean that it would be the case that a, uh, a system that does a better job of developing the force production, uh, is going to have, have, a you know, various kinds of edge over, uh, over competing systems. And I also think that it's extremely plausible that, you know, legal and political institutions will tend to rearrange themselves around however, you know, production is happening at the base of society, right? That's the, however, the thing that's the way that everybody meets their material needs and how everybody spends most of their days and all that stuff is, is going to tend to exert this gravitational pull over other, other kinds of social institutions to, to make it, you know, come into line with it. Right. I mean, like if, uh, you know, during the transition from feudalism to capitalism, the, uh, um, like you had all these, uh, like old guild rules that, you know, you, you weren't, um, you know, the guild master could only have a certain number of apprentices that, you know, would basically make factories impossible. Cause you know, cause, cause that would be too many apprentices. Uh, and you know, and, and I think you, I think for obvious reasons in a situation like, and, and like that, there's, incredibly strong incentives by a lot of different players in the system to pretend the law doesn't exist until it can be ignored until it can be actually overturned. And similarly for, you know, for, you know, laws that stopped, um, you know, that stopped peasants from, um, from leaving their land uh, to, you know, to go get jobs at said factories, et cetera. Right. Like I, th I think that there's this, there is this incredibly powerful gravitational effect of this and you know and I, and i i think that this i think it could happen in a lot of different ways right i mean this is the um you know that you can have like 
you know, like certainly if you read that final section of capital on primitive accumulation, I mean, Marx is describing a process that's playing out over the course of several centuries. Um, but you know, it, it has leap, you know, there are points, there are points where it happens really quickly and points where it happens really slowly and you have actual revolutions and you, you also just have sort of gradual processes that, you know, you might even keep the same institutions, right. The, uh, you know, you people embarrassingly uh, have a lot of your feudal, uh, uh, you know, pageantry still in place. Uh, but you know, yeah, but I mean, also like it's, there's a full county owned by the king, like he owns all the land there. Like, so it's not just a pageant awesome. pageantry; it's like a awesome. lot more than the pageantry. Yeah, it's a lot more than the pageantry, but it's a lot less than. Um, it's a lot less than what existed several yeah, years ago. Yeah, we are in fact the capitalist problem. country. Yes, exactly, right? Uh, so the <laughs> oh, we're declining so much that soon enough, you know. But maybe not forever, but yeah, no, like that they have a, that, yeah, that like, you know, that it, it has, uh, that over the course of, you know, over the course of time, right, you know, the sort of ways that legal rights and duties and uh, obligations like work themselves out, you know, that the, you, you end up having, you know, like essentially for most purposes, right. Most of the legal and political superstructure in the UK for all that it matters for most day-to-day -day purposes, isn't really that different than it is in like France. Yeah. And right? obviously so, the, the uh, King and his Royal estate manage this land as a capitalist, not as a few. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. He, he isn't, uh, you know, yeah. Charles isn't, uh, he's, he's isn't taking, trips, taking trips to his County to settle legal disputes, you know, and, 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 raise armies to defend it against bandits and, you know, all of that stuff is amazing as it would be. Uh, do, do you see that in Canada, they just speaking of embarrassing, yeah, embarrassing uh, they just the voted down, the king. Yeah. They just voted down a, uh, a bill that would have made the uh, oath of loyalty to King Charles optional. I mean, to be uh, honest, like it, it shouldn't be optional, right? Either you should have it or you shouldn't have it. Like it's embarrassing to have an o a, lo a loyalty oath that's optional. Like it's just a ridiculous idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I just I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't have, have I wouldn't uh, have sung God Save the King, but <laughs> would have voted against it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I uh, I think that you can. I think if you're <laughs> fucking reformist, uh, I think if you're making people. <laughs> If you're making people take an oath of loyalty to the king in 2024, I mean, this is like you've really got to take stock. And, you know, that's, I, I just, you know, I, as I said, I saw that. I love my many Canadian friends, but you guys really need to get your shit together. In the UK, the army officers have to take an oath of loyalty, uh, but Navy officers <laughs> don't because it's just, you know, it goes with territory. Of course they are. Yeah. Um, I wasn't I wasn't paying attention 100% for the past while because I was trying to work out the Trotskyite um, abolition of the Big Bang thing. And so, yes, you were correct that Ted Grant wrote a book, um, <laughs> Reason in Revolt, where he rejected Big Bang cosmology. Awesome. But what's more notable is that this theory is continually defended to this day uh, by IMT, the International Marxist Tendency. Um, awesome. I found one article from 2005 defending it, but also there's an article, a brand new ish article, um, just from last year. Um, basically, whenever there's some kind of evidence which isn't in line with the, the big bag model of cosmology, they drop a new article being like, Ted Grant was so right, guys. So, so <laughs> recently, um, evidence has come out from the James Webb telescope that galaxy formation happened much earlier. Then we would have thought, so. okay. and so they've just dropped in their article, being like, "Yeah, it's not real. It didn't happen. It was no big bang." They they That's, they seem offended by the idea that the big bang is like creation ex nihilo, <laughs> and okay. the only way, like you, we have to believe that there's like universal, uh, sorry, eternal. Uh, you know, when you go back and forth between a big bang and a big crunch, I've forgotten the term, but. 
Uh, oscillations. Yeah, maybe. Um, but it's interesting because I was thinking recently that um, I feel like Catholics and the Catholic Church didn't get as hyped as they should have with the Big Bang. Because in some <laughs> ways it, it was literally like, and then there was light. Yeah, no, true. Uh, this is, I mean, look, I, I actually think that this is uh, historically, this is something that's like, uh, um, it reflects well on, you know, atheist and agnostic physicists for, uh, for running with it. Cause, uh, cause it's, cause, and we, had, we had to wait until yeah, Trotskyism, right? British Trotskyism of the later 20th century. For finally for it to be rejected. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basis. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, this is well the. Uh, um, although I do, although I do really like the essay that came out today. You know, we're we're as of now we're, you know, approximately a week behind. Uh, the uh, but. Um, because the there wasn't an essay last week, because um, uh, I just did the announcement for the new capital class. Uh, I was going to say, which, you want to show uh, that? Yes, I do. Uh, so that is starting on May twelfth. So uh, I guess about four, you know, I guess four Sundays hence, uh, and it's going to be on Zoom from one to three p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then you can come watch this. And then you can come watch this. Exactly. Yeah. This is, yeah. We'd, we'd started doing it like way back when, uh, actually before, you know, yeah. So I did, when I did the first round capital class, I was doing it at that time slot because it seems like the thing that works out best for most people. Uh, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're in Taipei or something, you might you might be screwed. But if uh, <laughs> but, uh, there's a, there's a there's a one there's a very wide range of time zones you'll be okay in, right? Because that's you know, one EST is you know 10 a.m. in Los Angeles, 7 p.m. in Berlin. You know, so it's uh, you know, there's there's it's like a reasonable time on a day that almost everybody has off for most people. If you want to take that. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, when we did it before, uh, we just read, uh, volume one, but, uh, but this, <laughs> the next you know, figure this time. Years we'll be reading volume one, but then there's a plan to eventually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's 33 chapters, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a couple of years this time. Uh, kind of was last time, but, uh, that's, uh, uh, but yeah, this time there's, there's a plan to be fanatically completist about it and to, uh, to go through, uh, to go through all three volumes. So, uh, so yeah, that's, you know, go over to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. If you want to sign up, uh, for, uh, the class, I'm actually really looking forward to that. I've been, um, this is, uh, like it's been a little while. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think how long it's been since, since the, since round one ended, but it's been quite some time. I think it was and, definitely uh, contemporary with this, but it ended a while ago. So yeah, a bit, yeah, but. yeah, that seems right. Cause yeah, cause it was still going when we were starting this, but I don't think it was still going for a long like, time. Uh, like yeah, that seems right. So yeah, it's been almost a year. And honestly, I, I miss it. It's uh, like like for for me, you know, since it's ten a.m. for me, uh, like having that Sunday morning, spending a couple hours talking about capital is actually a really nice way to uh, uh, is actually a really nice way to start Sunday. So um, so yeah, I am I am definitely looking forward to that. And yeah, eventually I do want to do. You know, so if you sign up for the class, the the Zoom recordings of those will be available for people who are in the class. Uh, people ask about YouTube. I do eventually want to do like a version of this that'll make its way onto YouTube, um, like you know, in a classroom, David Harvey style, do like a nice like high production values kind of uh, kind of capital series. But I'm not quite sure when that'll happen. So meanwhile. Uh, anybody who uh, who wants to to read some capital, uh, sign up for this. You know, get the uh, then yeah, have a nice uh, 
can take an hour off, you know, go for a walk, have some coffee, come back and go to YouTube and watch us talk about philosophy. Yeah, I was like, wait, should I go? And I'm like, no, because I, I want to I wanna have my facilities for this, especially since presumably Ben will have a bit less facilities. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I should read volume two and three. But right now I want to I wanna read Nick Land. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think, I think, uh, you know, there are just a few things I'm sure of in this life, but one of them is uh, Marx greater than sign Nick Land. Uh, <laughs> but did, did Marx predict that in the 2020s, lots of people wouldn't be able to come? Because, <laughs> you know, he would have. Because that would have been a capital volume five. If, you, if he'd written in the 1990s, yeah. Because Nick Land was like right in the 1990s where everyone could come, saying that in the future right, people right. wouldn't ever come. And now everyone is SR, SR, SSRI and trans, which means they can't come. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's This is definitely a, a series of straightforwardly true statements that we just heard. Uh... <laughs> it is. I read it really this morning because it's 90% nonsense. And then 10% is like, <laughs> how the fuck did you predict that? <laughs> Fair enough. That uh, almost makes me want to read Nick Land. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I think Capital Volume 1 is obviously is a masterpiece in a way that 2 and 3 aren't. Um, Where's the bit about uh, like surface workers and kitchens and stuff? Is that in 3 or 2? 2. Okay. Yeah. 2, right? Because that's the... Yeah. Because, I mean, that feels like stuff that, uh, you know... No, there, that, well, that's the thing. So it's like there are, even though, right, I mean, let's be real clear on this, right? Volume one is the one that he got uh, Marx, you know, Marx got exactly the way he liked it and it shows, right? Like it has, that's that's where you've got the all of the, you know, like it's really well structured and you have all the allusions to Shakespeare and the Bible and Dante and the every chapter ending is a banger, even for pretty dry chapters, um, whereas volumes two and three are, you know, uh, Marx while dying, you know, says, Hey, Hey Ingalls, here's some notebooks, do what you can with these. And, uh, this is, you know, and, and so it's, it's not like that. Right. So it's, it's, it's like volume one is a pleasure in a way that the others aren't, but I still think two and three are worth reading because they've got stuff in there that are um yeah, if I was you know like it, that in a, like an abridged edition for a contemporary audience you'd certainly want to include the stuff about service workers <laughs> uh yeah yeah right yeah so i mean they have a like the stuff yeah exactly so the stuff where he's talking about you know productive and unproductive labor that's definitely important there's there's, there's actually some you know two in particular you know is is uh is pretty dry for the most part, but like, uh, but then three, um, like structurally it's a little bit more of a mess, but it's like, it's got the, um, and like, it just kind of ends, right? Like very abruptly, but Rick. like, it's, uh, exactly. Uh, but, um, but, uh, you know, that's where, you know, some of that stuff about like the realm of work and the realm of freedom and all that I'm sure you've seen quoted comes from that's where like probably the most direct, uh, some of the most direct arguments about uh, value and prices come in. And so it's, it's like, it's definitely all interesting and worth reading if you want to be fanatically completist about it. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, if you just, if you just, you know, there's only so much time and you just want to, uh, you know, you just, uh, you know, you, you have to, you have to save time to, to read, uh, Nick land, make predictions about coming, you know, so this, so, you know, you can only take in so much capital, uh, you know, you've only got a thousand pages or so in you, uh, just, uh, just, just read volume one. Yeah. I mean, and don't get scared of it. Like it's not that hard. People, people really hype it up and it's not that hard. And, you know, some of it's are hard to understand, but it's not really like, if you don't, like Marx gives lots of examples. So even if you're not really clear on like the theoretical bits, if you didn't really get it, 
You yeah. can read the examples and at least get the general impression of, of what the point is. Yeah, exactly. And, and I should say too, uh, people always get, um, always the, uh, like a lot of people start capital reading groups and uh, they end around chapter three, they give up. Uh, and I get it. You're not, you're not going to make people read it in your verse or edited edition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll be fanatically completist about it. We will read it in the original order, but, uh, but like, honestly, um, it's, this is just one of those things where you got to keep the faith because if, you know, you're starting to read in, you know, actually the end of chapter one is really good, but they have a, but like, if you, you know, if you start to read chapter one and you've got, uh, it's, you know, there are all of these examples about yards of linen, um, and, you know, and, and what 20 yards of linen are not equivalent to, and, uh, you get into, you know, and, and then, yeah, you get like, by the time you get through like all the stuff about money and, you know, it's, I mean, Marx himself has this phrase, you know, uh, about the metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties of commodity and money, uh, commodities and money, which is what the first three chapters are about. And, and a lot of that stuff is like people just sort of, you know, they get bored or they think, I don't understand anything that's going on here. I'm not smart enough. Uh, no, there's TikToks in this book. <laughs> yeah, they, they just stop reading, right? But honestly, um, even in chapter four, it's already getting better. And in, by the time you get to chapter six, it's actually honestly riveting, right? Because that's where the the class analysis uh, starts, and you know, it's like again, it's it's just one of the like you just kind of have to take it on faith that this is not a book that it, this is not thirty three chapters on how money works and you know how many yards of linen are equivalent to you know um, the uh, you know how many years of corn. Uh, this is by and large a book that's about the idea that capitalism is ultimately a class society, like the, the way feudalism is, but it works in a different way. Uh, how it is that uh, working hours are extracted uh, from workers by uh, by capitalists. Uh, how it's you know similar to and different from uh, earlier uh, earlier modes of uh, of production. Um, you know, how the, the system reproduces itself, why a lot of the ways that people who uh, have various kinds of utopian schemes for, for you know, making capitalism but not so bad uh, are, are missing the point, right? Like, I mean, I think, I think the most plausible, you know, people get very, uh, a lot of people sort of approach those first three chapters in a way that's very... Um, like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, uh, it's very like Talmudic, right? You know, the, uh, the, like, as they're sort of parsing exact turns of phrase and, you know, sentence by sentence to, you know, and, and I think oftentimes miss the larger point. Right. And I think the most plausible view I've seen of like, what's really going on in those first few chapters is that, uh, Marx is ultimately pushing back against various kinds of uh, utopian socialist weirdos who have uh, whose analysis of what's wrong with capitalism is that like money is bad and uh and I mean, that, it's also an important attack on kind of like money fetishism which is a very very common thing especially mm -hmm. at a time when they were on the gold standard yeah totally right and and the and the thing you know and so it's like i think part of the underlying agenda is to say look, if you do your scheme for like, oh, we're not going to have money anymore. We'll just have, you know, we'll, we'll have, uh, you know, special certificates, you know, that we'll exchange or whatever. Books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That a lot of the, I think a lot of the point he's actually making in those, those early chapters is this all just totally misses the point, right? This isn't going to help with anything uh, because look, money isn't something special that, you know, the, you know, gold is the money commodity. It's still just a commodity. 
that they uh that you know ultimately it's you know you're still just exchanging one amount of a commodity for you know for some amount of another commodity and you know the um you know you could theoretically have a version of capitalism where you just you know where you didn't have a universal equivalent you just bartered it'd be incredibly inefficient right but um and there's a reason we don't right you know but like and, and you you could sort of theoretically uh you know you could theoretically imagine uh something like that uh you know happening and you know and and he's you know and and marx is building an argument over the course of the book that says um you know look it's not that there's something special about money it's not that there's uh it's not just that like uh you know, it's, it's not about sort of intrusions into the market, right? I mean, that they, that like you have um, that, oh, the, the problem at the most fundamental level is not that the capitalists like rig the game, you know? But, right, I mean, he's, he's portraying capitalism as like an idealized version of capitalism, like if everything was going perfectly. Yeah, exactly, right? So he's saying, um, you know, he's... Yeah, for, for most of the book, he's making all kinds of idealizing assumptions. He's saying, look, let's just pretend for the sake of it. Like, you know, there's this whole, there's quite a bit of the book that's spent talking about um, working hours and, you know, the how um, how it is that, you know, that ultimately, you know, ultimately you're spending a certain number of hours of the day working to reproduce your own livelihood and then like a certain number of hours of the day to, you know, to enrich the boss and um and he says and he does even make a comment at one point he's like look i understand that one strategy that actually existing capitalists use is just to try to like drive wages down below the historically determined standard of living like i get that right that's obviously a thing that happens but i'm going to pretend for, for the sake of argument and all this that it doesn't happen right yeah, that, I mean, you couldn't keep doing it forever right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also true. But yeah, it's like they, so it's like, you know, so, so a lot of the argument of the book is like, look, let's, let's, let's pretend, right, that there's no force or fraud, that labor is always being purchased at its, at, at its value, uh, that the, that in other words, um, and he has like this very specific, very clever way of doing that, that they have a, that, you know, given his theory of what value is and all that. So this is, you know, like the, the working days of workers are always being purchased at their values. So nobody's being cheated in any way. Right. It's not that like the rules of market fairness just aren't being, you know, followed. It's just that you only need two assumptions, right? One is that you have some people as a matter of fact, who, uh, who have the resources, that it takes to to uh, own the means of production and employ others, and you have people who, as a matter of fact, however it came about, uh, do not have the resources to uh, go into business for themselves, so have no realistic choice except to rent themselves out to the first group. So you know you have that distribution, and you have markets, and that's it. That's all you need, right? That they that given those assumptions, uh, capitalism is is still going to be a class system, a exploitative system, the way that slavery and feudalism were. And that's like a big overarching argument that he's working out, you know, throughout the book, right? I mean, that's why the primitive accumulation stuff only comes in part eight, because he even says pretty explicitly, I want to say in like chapter 20, 20 something. Anyway, it's in the twenties. Uh, the, uh, he, um, uh, he, you know, he's sort of going over the exploitation argument again from a slightly different angle than he did earlier in the book. And, you know, and, and he, he says, okay, you, you can have, um, you can assume that workers, like, let's assume for the sake of argument that the capitalists, uh, you know, just use only legitimate means to, uh, to, to get, to get their initial operating funds that uh, the, so he says the, uh, it's the, the variable capital fund. In other words, the part of their profits they're using to pay, you know, the part of the revenues, of the firm they're using to pay workers wages uh, that 
Uh, let's assume they got it from only legitimate means. Perhaps he even says we could assume that the capitalists, you know, themselves was a worker who just did a really good job of saving up money, you know, for, uh, for, for a long time. Nevertheless, it wouldn't matter because, uh, cause, uh, over the course of time, workers are, you know, even if the first tank of gas in the variable capital fund is filled by the capitalists from some other mechanism, the workers themselves are constantly refilling it, uh, over the course of time. Right. So that's so, you know, I mean, otherwise, why did you invest in this factory? If you would have had to do the same thing you did anyway, before you yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Right. You know, so yeah. So he's making like all these limited. Just Cause they love to grind. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't understand because you don't you don't have the uh, grind set. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's like that you have um, so like in arguing against both, uh, you know, bourgeois economists, um, you know, Smith, Ricardo, and all those people, um, but also you know various kinds of um, you know various kinds of utopian socialists who he thinks missed the point about how or you know you know proud on mutualists or whoever who he thinks missed the point about how capitalism actually works and what's wrong with it uh you know he's he's building this overall argument over the course of the book that um you know this is you know that uh yeah one like a lot of a lot of what he's slamming the bourgeois economists for over the course of the book is treating like historically specific features of capitalism as just like eternal natural features of any sort of production process ever. Uh, but and, it's pretty funny when it was been going on for like 80 years when he was writing. Yeah, that's also very true. Uh, yeah, very fresh at that time. Um, yeah, everybody, yeah, was, everything was, you know, yeah, all the, uh, yeah, everything was basically brand new. Everybody, uh, you know, like everybody was just uh, like, yeah, yeah. Every... I mean, it's true. It's true today that people are like things have to be this way, and there's no yeah. alternative to something that came into being like seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like you need an internet-enabled phone, or you no? Just I was die. just yeah. I was just gonna try to come up with some sort of callback about how back then everybody could definitely still come, but um, <laughs> it's, you know, just look at how many children they had. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> and, um, that's yeah that uh so but then also again you know that the thing the thing that's wrong with capitalism is not um you know is not you know something about money or something about the way that you know capitalists like work the refs to get the state to do this or that for them uh or or anything like that that you know that that just given that you know get just given some people um some people having the assets they do some people not have not having those assets just markets doing their thing uh will will do will do the rest right so that's um and yeah it's it's a really anyway look it's uh it, i think that if nothing else um I, you know if nothing else i think that it's a um you know, I mean, it's, it's worth reading it just to, to have read it, to have like, like, as you say, a lot of people sort of end up being intimidated by it. And, you know, the chapter order definitely doesn't help because, uh, the, the stuff at the beginning is the least accessible stuff in the book. Uh, but, uh, the, but it gets so much better, right. You know, from, from, uh, you know, from, from chapter six onwards, um, you especially like a, like a good read reviewer uh, of like a mediocre fantasy novel. <laughs> You know, but it's also, um, but it's also, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you, you know, it, it, I think if you're interested in talking and thinking about Marxism and if, if you're not, I don't know why you're watching us right now, you know, cause, uh, surely, you know, surely your Sunday afternoon doesn't, you know, doesn't need to be spent watching a, a, a video with word dialectics in it. Nobody's making you do this. So you probably are interested in Marxism. Uh, so if you are interested in this, then it's like, look, this is, this is the book, right? You know, you should, uh, you know, if there's one book that's the book, you know, for, for Marxism, uh, this would be it. So you should read it. So you'll have better informed opinions. And, 
um, and you'll get a lot out of it. And a lot of it's have a lot you, of fun. Have you heard of the video game Victoria 3? <laughs> no, I have not. Victoria 3 is a video game, a grand strategy game, where you take a, a country in 1836 and you play them until 1936. And the point basically is to transition them from a feudal economy to a capitalist economy. Um, and it's actually funny because it's kind of, uh, in the current state of the game, I would say it's a more Marxist game than reality is. Yeah. In a, in a strict orthodox sense, because in the game, um, India will like industrialize and progress under British imperialism, uh, despite that obviously not being something that happened in reality. But yeah. in the next patch, um, they're basically adding Marxist Leninism to the to the Marxism. They're patching in in Leninism, which basically allowing foreign investment and meaning that owners don't have to live in the same state okay. as as the things they own. So I'm looking forward to um, Victoria Three. Uh, adding in Leninism. It's a it's a game I played multiplayer with with Gene. Um, well, you just reminded me earlier when you were talking about uh, gold, because I I was playing Mexico, and obviously as Mexico you have a big problem, and that problem is called the United States. Right. Um, but I managed to hold on long enough to start exploiting the gold in California and so on, and so basically my country became like fifty percent of the population works in gold mines and gold related industries. And the other half just have a gun. And then every five years we fight an apocalyptic war with the United States to defend our gold. But I was reminded because Victoria 3 does have this kind of gold fetishism where gold, the the was it the, the money commodity, is the yeah. only thing which doesn't vary in price. Or okay. value. It's just, it just has a fixed value, it just stays as it is. So it's not perfectly Marxist, but it's as best as you're going to get. Fair enough. Uh, you know, I uh, I don't know. I think I might not have. Uh, I think I might have never, literally, never played a video game more uh, more contemporary than Mario Kart. But uh, <laughs> yeah, not not exactly grand strategy Marxist capitalist feudal transition games. Yeah, uh, but that does actually sound kind of fun. I'm I'm officially intrigued. No, it's fun. I was I remember talking to Ashley about it and she was like, Oh, I should play the game. And she's like, Oh no, I shouldn't. I should watch you or Gene play that game. <laughs> so yeah, eventually enough. eventually me and Gene will will stream it on TIR, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you learn yeah. how to work on OBS because it lags really bad on uh restream. Yeah. HG uh be really funny if I did like game streams, but only for like games that I was already like familiar with. So it would mostly just be me like playing Ms. Pac-Man. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. I'm looking forward to, you know, we should get a stream with you and Ashley and, and me and, and G and you two can just not play the game. And we're like, look, it's just like Marxism. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> as I, as I build the, we build could, a can, linen we factory. The equivalent of the, um, uh, I remember this old Hannibal Burris joke about uh, where he's like making fun of the way that, you know, some rappers would, uh, you know, not just like do little samples from other, other musicians, but just like play like a bunch of it and like, just, just be like, and just like occasionally add, you know, Oh yeah, that's right. You know? And, you know, and so to like make fun of it, he played this like old Chris rock bit for like five minutes, part of his set. <laughs> and all he was like, like, yeah, good point. He's so right. <laughs> you know, so like um, Ashley and I could contribute in that vein. Uh, what's next week? Well, if we were, uh, we can decide, of course, whether we're going to uh, continue to be a week behind uh, or uh, or catch up. Uh, if we do continue to be a week behind, it's uh, it's going to be an essay called uh, Richard Dawkins' Nonsense Makes Me Miss the Not Quite New Atheism of Quentin Smith. If we decide to catch up to the present day, we'll see. Ah, there hasn't been a choice. It's 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 lucky dip for me. <laughs> Very my immense powers of being like, oh yeah, that's it. All. Exactly. Okay. Well, uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>